how has it looked just forming an organization from what are the what are the details that went into into thinking through the you know formulation of an organization uh, as the founder mm-hmm. what what are the mentality that you needed to hold at the time uh, did you did you put together a team did you put together a board you're used to being in a board did you how did you <laughs> <laughs> in boards how yeah. did you did you need to surround yourself with a new mentors at the time to you know guide you through this um, to understand this is a sector that you understood in terms of working with young people but mm-hmm. now you are leading an organization you are needing to look for resources to run mm. these kind of things how has how did that journey start for you and how has it been uh, over the years i'm going to be very honest with you mm. had i known and seen the journey ahead mm. before starting mm. i doubt i would have started thank you mm-hmm. <laughs> i know <laughs> but tell me more <laughs> wow mm. let me summarize the journey by quoting winston churchill mm-hmm. the journey has been full of tears mm. sweet blood and toil mm. that's what he said mm. just boring Churchill's words mm. but mm. let me add mm. it's been meaningful it's been mm. worthwhile fulfilling fulfilling mm. yes mm. that's the word mm. despite the challenges the tears the sweat the mm. toil mm. the journey mm. is and has been mm. meaningful mm. so let's hear about those toils the the story behind the glory let's hear about those the, the details of what that has looked like um uh, because a lot of leaders who watch this a lot of practitioners a lot of startups uh mm-hmm. both who have sat in this um who have you know st- sat here uh, who have you know who have shared their story on this channel um in the development space as 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 people have failed in business people have uh, started off as entrepreneurship and fa- uh, even in social enterprise and failed completely miserably have invested have tried looking for resources uh we know how long it takes to even write a proposal it's like a campaign you know it i equate it to the five year cycle to like a campaign yeah. cycle you know you, you you start off with campaigning or write, writing a grant almost for like a whole year mm-hmm. you know just trying to look for money and then when money comes after one year you you have like three years of implementation year zero is ground zero trying to break ground reports all I, mnd and all of those kinds of things it's it's a very taxing very taxing field and at times people just think that ngos ngo world has a lot of money not understanding that it's very very taxing it's mm-hmm. very demanding um, there is at least often no room for you might have a lot of money but not even a shilling that everything is earmarked so you have a lot of money but you are very broke because everything is literally everything is water you know water needs to you 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 have bought water for 10 shillings and it cannot be 11 yeah <laughs> you know yeah. you have put a conference for 30 shillings and it cannot be 31 so it at times is very and it's not <coughs> just about budgets it's also about the time needs to be this period and it cannot move mm. to october 31st you know because it needed to have ended by october 30th so it's a very taxing field yeah. um highly donor dependent but everyone out there thinks oh ngos have a lot of money or i ngos for that matter have a lot of money so it's a it's very demanding has your experience been i, I think that's what you're saying if you look 10 back 10 years later you're like ah uh-uh, 
I would not have started this journey if <laughs> yeah. I know what I know now. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people say that, you know, like, eh, hey, NGOs, I don't want even, after experiencing that, like, I don't want, I, I would rather just go and start a business. Then you go in business, you realize it's the same. Mm. You know, you go into employment, you realize it's the same. Yeah. So there's no safe ground. Nothing <clears> good <throat> comes easy. Nothing good comes easy. But let's hear your experience. Wow. So you start in 2012. You register as a how was the registration? Did someone help you? So mm-hmm. I reached out to a lawyer mm-hmm. to start the process. <coughs> I had saved up some money. Mm. And I remember him telling me I will need seventy five thousand Kenya shillings. Oh. I said, Wow, I don't have this money. Mm. Let me go search, I'll come back. Mm-hmm. I went away for like three weeks to one month and I, I said but you know what? He could get started as I look for money and then pay mm. slowly. At least some few things. Yes. Name search. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I reached out. But before, even before starting, I, like, like where something was bathed was in Addis Ababa. Mm-hmm. I attended the African Peer Review Mechanism Heads of State Summit because mm. then that semi Kenya was being reviewed. At the AU. At the AU. Mm. Um, and I sat in the audience mm-hmm. and interesting things happened. Mm. There, there was only one woman in the room mm. amongst the heads of states. Mm-hmm. And that was um, former Liberian president, Ellen Johnson Saleh. Mm. Mm. And I asked myself, the continent, ha- like over 52% of the population of is the women. continent is women. Mm. Where are women? How come Leader, leadership, yeah. they mm. are not in this um, space mm. where decisions are made? Mm. So the whole yes, the whole beautiful EU. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been in that room before yeah. a number of times, and I see. So the entire space was just women. It was just men, dudes, yeah. men, <laughs> men, and then and heavily the in, interesting lot of development issues are focused on women. Exactly. So they were just tilting to whichever side, but only one woman representative, yes. one woman president. Yeah. Oh dear. Mm. And then. <coughs> I looked around the room and of course there were no younger or youthful individuals. Mm. And again, I asked, and, and a number of young people who were there were either carrying briefcases or, you know, the not takers representing their countries. And I said, again, the continent has over 70% of the population being youth. Where are the young people? Again, it took me back to the to the question of capacity, exposure, mentorship, and right. you know, mm. all that stuff. And so I said, you know what? What would happen to the African continent if we had more ethical leaders and, and women and young people in these spaces? The story of Africa would, would be different. The story of Kenya would be different. And so I came back with the idea that in the spaces where I was serving, let me propose to them that uh, we start youth mentorship. And by then, very few people who are thinking and talking mentorship. And all the organizations I reached out to to say, have you guys thought of mentorship? Can, 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 can you do mentorship for young people? Because what young people just need to then get into these powerful spaces is mentorship and guidance. Many of them said, no, this is not our core purpose. No, we're not focusing on that. No. So I then said, I see a need for mentorship. So then let me start. So then reached out to this lawyer. His name is Andrew Ranja. And when he told me 75,000 shillings, I didn't have that money. I went away and then now came back after like a month to then say, you know what? I would like for you to just get started. And he asked me a number of questions. And one of the questions, like critical question for him to make the decision was, is this a faith venture or have you seen a business opportunity and you just want to make money? I said, by the way, I know young people need empowerment. I see Kenya's transformation will happen through leaders and I want to nurture ethical and values-based leaders to then get into those spaces, parliament, economic spaces, private, um, um, private sector and all other spaces to lead change to then ensure this dignity for every man, woman, or child. So it's not about business. And he said, you know, 
for me to be where I am today, somebody believed in me. A lawyer with a law firm took me under his arm and believed in me for me to be here. And so I'm going to believe in you. You will not pay 75,000 Kenya shillings. You will pay 5,000. I had carried 10,000. I was so happy that I actually added him the 5,000 to just say thank you. Like, you wow. know, yeah, that was such a helping hand. Mm -hmm. So he then started the registration process. And in 2012, we then mm -hmm. got the certificate. Mm -hmm. And then guess what? After that, mm. I kept waiting for things to be perfect for me to start. I thought I will have all the money. I thought I needed a website. We needed an office. We needed staff for us to start. And so I sat back in my house and waited. Month one, nothing is happening. And I'm wondering, so wh why is nothing happening? Nothing was happening because I was doing nothing. I was waiting for the situation perfect, to be perfect yeah. for me to start mm. <clears throat> month two nothing three nothing four nothing five i said hey okay i better get started and i asked myself do i need money to mentor young people student leaders i said no i just need to share my journey my story lessons and harness the the, the power of my friends who are experts in different spaces to then come in and talk to them and I left my house and went and said, so where, which is my starting point? And I said, I was at the University of Nairobi. I was a student leader. I still have networks with student leaders, with the administration. So why not start here? So I went to the um, um, student leader's office and female students were just preparing to have, to celebrate the International Women's Day. And they were wondering, so where can we get a speaker? Who can come and talk to us you know we need money and i said i'm here i'll come and speak and no you, you don't need to pay me and so that's how it began at um, stella winja hostel mm. they stella. mobilized yes mm. they mm. mobilized about 50 female students um, of university of nairobi and i went and talked to them about personal leadership shared my own journey um, and all that and after that five female student leaders reached out to me and said, I'd, I'd like for you to mentor me. I'd like to know what you know. And I said, oh yeah, of course, we can, we can work together. And I started with those five student leaders. The next meeting we had, they invited like two people each. We went to like maybe a, about nine people. Then after that, like 13. Then we grew like to 17. And, and so I was operating from my house, one bedroom house, and I was living with my younger, uh, two of my younger, two or three, three of my younger sisters. Um, and then I converted a little corner to be the office. And, you know, I pimped up the, the, the desk to look like a proper office. And so that's where I'd wake up, work from, you know, then get to dream and envision stuff about Emerging Leaders Foundation. Um, and then go to the University of Nairobi, um, find a class that is not being used, and then sit in there with the students and talk about self-awareness. You know, the other day, last week, two of the student leaders who started with me, all of them were women, but then one of them had a friend, a, a male friend, and they, they used to come together. They called me last week to say, Karen, we're getting married in February. Oh. And we looked at our journey and traced it to ELF. And we remember you guiding us to how to introduce ourselves about self-awareness and, you know, all that stuff. And we're just calling to say thank you and to invite you to our wedding. Oh, dear. You know, I, was, I was so happy that such a small, small thing can actually lead to, you know, stuff, mm. stuff like that. Mm. But then I would leave the house, go to the University of Nairobi. By then they were allowing members of the public to just come in um, and when the team grew we then started going to the arboretum mm. we pay the entry fee uh, and then put monies together um, and a lot of it would be my money uh, then buy uh, water buy juice and then get to dilute buy cookies and queen cakes then walk to the arboretum have a session and maybe i've invited a friend who is a guru in personal finance management or in personal branding and you know stuff like that and they would come 
speak with the ladies and then we play games and then we walk away um and i remember moments when it would rain and there's no place to shelter at aboretam and we would you know run looking for shelter those humble beginnings oh mm. man oh mm. Mm. priceless yeah mm. and you know we then moved from meeting at the aboretam um and we started finding certain spaces where we didn't need to pay much to then meet and at some point i discovered you know what we're only meeting when i have money when i have no money we don't meet but surely these young women can also contribute for us to either buy juice or buy tea and you know get to meet up and by this time i was already wondering i wasn't making any money but i was doing consultancies like training for kenya school of government um doing research for Ipsos Innovate and a few other consultancies here and there training for other institutions to then make money mm. to take care of my siblings take care of myself and then now take care of um the volunteers and um the organization and i started questioning and and wondering so how do organizations run how do organizations make money how do you facilitate programs and sessions and all that and i applied to join the east african acumen fellowship mm. i applied the first time they said no <clears throat> i applied the second time they said no i was so determined because i knew i needed some training all i had when i started emerging leaders foundation was the passion i had so much passion in my belly to see change and transformation mm. that i didn't think i needed the skill So now time came when I needed to run the institution so that means mm. I needed the skill. Mm. So finally I got enrolled in the East African Acumen Fellowship and that's where I learned about social entrepreneurship. Mm. And I learned about the fact that people out here are willing to pay to learn what they do not know. Mm. And I remember this time a parent uh, bringing to me her two daughters in high school and told me my daughters are problematic I need you to coach them. Um so how much do you charge? And I said, "Oh, so she wants to pay." I said, "No, I'll 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 do it for free." And she said, "No, you're putting in your time, your resources, your energy, your expertise. I want to pay." So I said, "Wow, okay, I'll think about it and and tell you how much." And so of course I wasn't going to think about it. I didn't even know how how do you do that the, the pricing price. and yeah. you know all that. And in the night she sent me a text message and said, "I'm waiting." So I just said, okay. 20k. 10k, 10k for each of the girls. And she sent me the money immediately. And that the 20k enabled me to do so much. And that's when I said, "Oh, okay. So we actually need to charge to be able to generate revenue to then run the programs." And because then I also had a few friends like three or so who were volunteers serving with me. and at the end of the month i would give them like 3k um for air time and transport and i would even forget to pay myself that was one mistake i i i made i i have since learned that as an entrepreneur you have to pay yourself first you know before you you pay other people and so um i then went to consolidated bank building along Kainanga street and found a space as a small space where a law firm was leasing um mm. space and, and furniture and so i used to um rent out the table like one workstation was like 300 bob one chair we were three that would be like 200 times the number of chairs and and um a, a bookshelf and would pay that every month and the rent was 10,000 Kenya shillings and that was going well i was kind of making it especially through the different consultancies I, i was engaging in but still ends were not meeting it was challenging but then in the process i had reached out to a number of uh, people i respected i held in highest team people either i had served with in 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 a board or uh, I had just encountered in certain spaces impeccable men and women and reached out to them to say would you consider coming to serve on the board of this organization that I'm starting this is the vision and they said yes and one of them is your friend Dr Katindi mm. she's a board member mm. um Justice Daniel Msinga the president mm. of the the 
low court, the high court mm. is our board member okay. professor chege michael chege is the chair of our board Fantastic. dr musimbi yondeko andrew ranja Fantastic. larry lisa patience nyange you've got and really good people yeah, you've got a very diverse and wide very committed mm. very committed absolutely and mm. they guided me and i remember the time when we made the decision that you know what we want a kenya that has leaders mm. who are ethical and care about people and so we want to empower both men and women so let's open this up to mm. work with both young men and young mm. women so mm. elf mm. is an organization that works with both young men and young women and young women yeah what determine the size of board of the board mm. um i did some research and, and found that a good board is like Seven, seven to, nine. to about nine, eleven. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we have a board of seven. Okay. Di yeah. um, and the principal, so you, did you put up together like a board charter? Yes, we have a board charter. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All those things. Oh, oh man. You had, I... So you had, so um, is it the board that helped to put together that yes, charter? Yes, definitely the board. Yeah. The board. Yeah. Yeah, they, and and they've really ena enabled us as an organization to make certain policies, to policies in yeah. place and make certain decisions that have led us to to where we are mm -hmm. as an organization. All right, I'm eager to hear how it continues. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. time came when the rent was increased mm -hmm. by more than half, and mm -hmm. of course I wasn't able to pay. So I decided, you know what, I think I need to go back to operating from home. So mm -hmm. went back home for some time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then later, somebody invited me to Cardinal Lotunga Plaza, where mm -hmm. uh, we were hosted by another organization, mm -hmm. and all we needed to do was pay rent. Mm -hmm. um, and we were there for like about a year. Mm -hmm. it, it was an amazing space. It was a fully furnished office, but mm -hmm. then we were required to come in with our own furniture. Mm -hmm. And I had saved up like some money, about 157,000 Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. And I used that to purchase furniture mm. that we needed. Mm. Then we moved in. Mm. But after about a year, the two business partners started having issues. And mm. so we were required to move out. Mm. And I remember one of them who invited us then came to me and said, you know what? Um, you might actually need to move out of this place at night. Um, because this person wants to get back at me through your organization through hurting your organization and said, no, you know, the work we do, uh, transparency, accountability, honesty, authenticity, these things are so key. So no, I will go and talk to her and tell her, mama, thank you for hosting us for this time, but time has come when we need to leave. So can we carry our furniture? And he said, okay, fine, then you'll be on your own um, when that time comes. Hey. I reached out to the lady, um, an elderly lady, very respectable. In fact, I used to call her mom. And then I explained to her and said, oh, so thank you so much. You know, you've hosted us for this period of time and so we're living. And she said, you know, if you carry your furniture now, the caretaker might think that I'm the one who's shifting. So why don't you come back after three months? So after three months, I went back and she said, no, I'm not ready to release the furniture. Um, give me some time. Come back after three months. After three months, went back. And she said, oh, you know, you, you're doing a good job of creating the next generation of leaders. You know, that, that's awesome. As a country, we need that. But you know, I've kept this furniture for you for six months now. So I just need a small token of appreciation and I will release it. I said, but mom, you know, I'm barely making it. I'm, I'm struggling. And she said, okay, you'll just pay a hundred thousand Kenya shillings. I said, mom, I don't have that money. And she said, okay, I'll reduce it down to 80,000 Kenya shillings. And I said, I, I don't think even I'm able to raise that. And she said, no, I'm giving you the whole week. That was on a Monday. Um, if by Friday you haven't come with that token of appreciation, there's a gentleman who walked in here and liked your furniture. I will, I will sell it to him. So I went away and kept looking for money, kept looking for money to just <laughs> go and then get to collect our furniture. I didn't get the money. That's how we lost the furniture. Who wasn't the request to keep the furniture hers in the first place? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
that was such one one of the lowest moments that was one of the lowest moments of my life and of the journey of uh, elf and around the same time um there's a gentleman who had reached out to say oh you guys are doing an amazing job um and i, I want to support and this is how i want to support and so he gave us books uh, gave us a laptop gave us a video camera um brought us an intern who he used to pay every month to support the work we were doing and and that was going well till at some point i discovered he wanted more than an ordinary relationship he wanted an affair and when that wasn't forthcoming one time he calls me and tells me Karen I need my everything back everything i ever <laughs> i ever gave to ELF i want it back oh dear yeah oh man that was devastating oh dear and it happened the same year when we had just oh. lost the furniture and then by then i had learned that organizations write proposals and go for pitching competitions mm. uh, and so we had done so many proposals we responded to so many calls for proposals mm. over 50 and only just about five organizations wrote back to say either you're not qualified or we only work with big organizations or we want to see your track record before investing in you and stuff like that and i wondered so how do we show a track record when we don't have resources to then you know even yeah. do the work to showcase mm-hmm. the impact mm. and that was a no like oh man that that was that was a really difficult time and i remember two of the volunteers one of them quit her job to come and work for ELF and we knew things were going to pick up but it took so long remember year 1 2012 no funding 2013 no funding 2014 no funding 2015 no funding <laughs> so in 2015 that's when um one of them came and said hey Karen you know my husband has been supporting us and meeting all the needs of the family but i feel it's time i start chipping in and so i actually would like to leave and get a proper job. And so we worked together and she got a job and she left. Uh but continued supporting as a trainer and you know mentor. And the other one also came and said, "You see Karen, yes I've been doing this and my mother has been supporting me, but now I just graduated with my master's degree and she tells me I'm now a big girl. I need to live on my own and I need to get a proper job that pays me so I can't do this anymore." And so again she left and that was that was difficult and I got tempted to to just drop the ball and go find a job and there were offers but I kept thinking so I strongly feel that this is the core of my being this is my life's purpose mm-hmm.